Uh, greetings, Womandeka and Talofa uh, Before we officially get started, I want to take this time to acknowledge that although we are gathered online, we are all calling in from all sacred lands and waterways of First Nations peoples, the Aboriginal people, protectors of 60,000 years of rich culture and songlines. The Wadawurrung people are the traditional owners of the lands that I am settled on. I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and to the young future leaders to come. I also acknowledge the ancestors that we carry with us and the elders joining with us online. Welcome. I also want to acknowledge that during this pandemic, we are also witnessing the boiling point of continued systematic oppression on Black communities. It is important that justice is centered, amplified, and in support of Indigenous communities. We won't see climate justice until justice for First Nations is achieved first. I also want to acknowledge and wish a happy Pride Month to our LGBTQIA plus community and wish a happy Refugee Week. This event is presented in partnership with Yarra Libraries. Yarra Libraries welcomes emerging writers and hosts monthly write-in sessions for practicing, sharing, and refining their work. For more information, please go see their website. Welcome to Emerging Writers Festival's live stream and performative event called Creative Responses to Climate Crisis. Tonight, we have an amazing lineup of talented and leading artists who will share and present in a storytelling platform called Kutcha Kutcha. My name is Florence Polole Tukwola, and it's an honor to be your host for tonight's virtual gathering. Please get yourself comfy, have your beverage and food source at reach, and enjoy. Before we kick off, uh, we will now watch a short introduction video to Kutcha Kutcha. Kachakujo is a Japanese word for chit-chat and is the name of a presentation format created in Japan in 2003 by Astrid Klein and Mark Dyson, two architects looking for a way people could share their work quickly and simply in public. Since then, the idea has spread to over 700 cities around the world. At every Pechakucha night, creative thinkers come together and share their ideas with only 20 images shown for 20 seconds each. Pechakucha, a fast fun format. Find a location. Join the conversation. who grew up on Wiradjuri people's land as a first-generation migrant from Samoa of a family. Emerging Indigenous storyteller in civil Samoa, visual art, climate justice, and social justice. Advocates cultural resilience and artistic healing with and for Oceania, Moana, Tawara. She brings to light mental well-being, activism, and decolonization for the young Pacific diaspora youth in so-called Welcome to Alice. Unlearn to relearn my actions. I'm a Samoan and first generation migrant of my family. Rugby League brought my parents here. In poverty, my family thrived in the Rogery people's land built up for migration. My family continues to thrive in labor shortage of seasonal work and Pacific Islanders' sporting contribution in this country that systematically calls us a minority. Hard work and sacrifices are values etched in my hand. I knew at a very young age how safe art was to be in and to hide in. Later on, the reality of my creations was a scream for liberation. Silenced by the injustices I faced, I knew that art would be a platform for me to push me. I was ready to get hurt and heal a mig migrant family's intergenerational trauma. Identity crisis is such a painful journey. Connecting to culture through dance with the guidance of my people navigated me to community and aloha. 
in Sierra Samoa, I was unlearning and relearning more about my mother tongue, customs, and traditions. I mourned and celebrated this journey. A service to my people's stories and our genealogy. On a night that amplified the frontline stories of ocean people, the Fukuyasu voices called out through many branches of creativity. No boundaries to express our stories of pain, love, shame, and the courage to do together. We spoke truth with our Pacifica and wider community here. On that same night, I was reading stories together with a Samoan sister from the motherland. The exchange uncovered the deep complexities of our people's stories separated by ocean. We were able to resonate with, our, with each other of our differences and ground our collect, collective love as an ocean. The desire to act ignited during my first climate action. In ceremony and looking across a white building I once worked in. From then on, I acknowledged my own privilege, my own ignorance, and my own vested entitlements brought up in this country. At that moment, I was standing on the right side to unlearn. In a circle, the people sat around in solidarity. Sitting in parliament, political leaders could hear the cries of injustice. I realized the urgency for the people to be united, and most importantly, led by First Nations people on the front line. Pacific elders stood up in the center and looked at us. You too can move. I must center my actions on the resilience of ocean people on the front lines of this crisis. The power of indigenous knowledge in activist spaces, be uplifted and stand in peaceful resistance. Welcoming the storytelling power of weaving, healthy dance, music, literature, and poetry. Many of you. Sharing stories with grassroots communities empower them to understand how important our voices are to rise and stand up for the Pacific, to relearn the existing colonized systematic oppression, corruption, and racism. Together with them, I was relearning my duty to lead with empathy, love, care, and resilience. Returning to Samoa in my journey of relearning, I could see the direct impacts of the crisis and the truth of scientific warnings denied by leaders. The urgency to adapt and survive during this crisis is a daily routine for my family. My grandmother, Nia, will never stop protecting the land and burials of loved ones to the inheritance of us. Pacific Ocean is the largest in the world and home to the greatest navigators. The Blue Ocean is the main source of survival for people to thrive in Mother Earth. Pacific Nation leaders, together with people, continue to lead the fight and, gen and demonstrate a just recovery for a safe and renewable transition and yet we'll be the first to be impacted. We are on the front lines fighting, and as the ocean rises, so must we. It was election season. I traveled to a regional town in Queensland with a group of young Pacific people with the purpose to give community our people's frontline troops, a community who thrives in the mining industry, but were also willing to unlearn. In a circle, they heard our truth, our love, and hope. This photo. Post election grief. The Morrison government continues to deny, abolish, and profit from injustice. That piece of coal, that is cultural significance to Indigenous people, and a shameful act of abuse that still plays. Defeated, I had to take care and fill my cup before I fill others. The world is watching the intersectional injustice of indigenous people, such as Ihu Matau, Mauna Kea, West Papua, Kanaki, Bougainville, and Jaburong people. Indigenous people unite in ceremony as respect to elders. We must respect the consultation, the respect and solidarity and allyship with Mok. Leaders and ancestors of the future generation, let us, let us acknowledge that climate leadership of young indigenous people who have been in the fight for many years. May they continue to lead the way in classrooms, protests, and community. Their relationship between the youth and elders is essential. The responses from this relationship instills love, mentorship, wisdom, protection, and longevity of our culture and our fight. Earlier this year, I left so called Australia as it was burning. I arrived on motherland soil who was recovering from the measles pandemic. In a circle, my family bestow, bestow titles to protect the land, lineage, and our troops. I sat opposite my father in ceremony, knowing that one day his eldest daughter would inherit his duty. 
ongoing genocide of the ecosystem, custodianship, and community frontline recovery is still in crisis. Essential workers being neglected by ignorant leaders in power. Strategic and creative planning are rapidly in play to confront injustices. People's lives and health are a major priority in this kind of pandemic. I hope the reflection of our responses will be their survival and strength and connection to culture. We hope for young Indigenous people to inherit and protect the relationship in history with land and ocean by their ancestors. Like the way we treat and protect the land and ocean is a mirror of how we undeniably treat and act on each other as human beings. To loudly acknowledge and stand firmly in solidarity for First Nations and for the mob to lead the fight for climate justice is the leading response in this, part, in this crisis. We must unlearn and relearn in a country filled with 60,000 years of history and culture. Solutions, healing, and protecting the country come directly from Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, and South Sea Islander people. There is no justice without justice for First Nations first. Climate crisis and social injustice come hand in hand, and negligence of power has always been at the front of our doorstep. As a generation to act on it now, it's about time that we unlearn to relearn our history and actions together. That's my level. And lastly, I just want to add uh, to the West Papua, uh, may uh, freedom and self-determination um, always, always, always lead the way. And so we'll always raise the morning star. Free West Papua. Great. And uh, next up, we have uh, the lovely Amanda. Amanda Anastasi is a Melbourne poet with work appearing as locally as Mintz's artist Flaming Wars to the Massachusetts Review. She is the author of 2012 and other poems and the co-author of The Silent Sea. Amanda was awarded a Lila Center Host Desk Fellowship in 2018 to work on an upcoming poetry collection set in the year 2042. She is currently a research associate at the Monash University Climate Change Communication Research Hub where she is writing poetry to raise awareness on ecological issues and the climate crisis. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Filoli. Um, I would like to, first of all, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I stand and the land that I'm about to speak of and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. What you are seeing is a series of 21 line poems, which were written as part of my residency. As you view the poems and images, I will be reading my article entitled The Power of One Line Poetry to Communicate Climate Change, which I contributed to BAMOS, which is the Bulletin of the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society earlier this year. Poetry is unique in the way it can hold up a mirror to new and confronting realities. It is a unifier in its ability to hone in on a particular moment or place in time. As a proponent of the power of brevity in poetry and the use of the fewest words possible, the one line poem is a poetic form of fascination for me. When writing a one line poem, I find myself creating a hook for the reader as I try to summarize an entire story in a line, simultaneously inviting the reader to color the story with their own interpretation. The aim is to create an image and an action that stays long after the poem has been read or heard. Monostitch poetry was described by American poet Kimiko Hahn as, quote, a startling fragment that has its own integrity. Drawing on my experience of writing poetry addressing environmental catastrophe and extinction, and also currently writing a set of poems set in the year 2042, my appointment as resident poet at Monash has allowed me to focus on the science and impacts of climate change. Among my completed poems for the hub to date are these 20 monostitch or one line poems related to climate change. Some set in the future and others prompted by recent events. 
The pairing of poetry and science is not altogether unusual. Both poetry and science are concerned with observational detail and unconcerned with opinion. Poetry provides that additional emotional human element and a meeting of image and storytelling in a way that enables emotional relatability. Following the Australian bushfires, the subject of climate change has gone from a vague and distant concept to a threat much closer to our doorsteps and domestic lives. In fact, some of the futuristic poems I wrote in the early part of 2019 for The Hub are now being circulated in the form of one-line poems and seem more like current day observations than, and, and are being received as such. I first encountered the monostitch poem when reading Ian McBride's Slivers, which is a poetry collection consisting entirely one-line poems. My first monostitch poems began appearing online in 2000, from 2016, including in Cooler Bar 23, the short poem issue. And the issues forward, um, the fellow Australian poet Peter Bukowski writes that the short poem is, quote, wit, wisdom, wordplay and wonder whittled into a dart aimed to hit the bullseye, which is you, dear reader. For the hub, I wanted to do something new with a one-line poem, being acutely aware of the hub's strategic preference for short, accessible messaging. Also aware that Instagram poetry was gaining popularity and I, I explored the idea with Dr. David Holmes of creating one-line poem memes for social media sharing. Pairing the poems with complementary pictorial images was aimed at both increasing the approachability and understanding of each poem and enable, enabling social media shareability. Presenting the poems in this way was also more likely to reach current non-poetry readers. The koala that survived cannot find a leaf. Koala is one of the one-line poems featured on the Hub's website. It immediately confronts the reader with the reality of the koala's plight. In a single line, it aims to capture the vulnerability and multi-pronged threat to the koala due to factors such as bushfires and past and current logging practices and how human activity is creating multiple challenges to the species' survival. This poem is just one of several one-line poems currently featuring on the Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub website. These one-line poem memes are shareable via Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And it is my hope that those Australians feeling frustrated and saddened by the impacts and aftermath of the Australian bushfires will find some articulation in these poems for what has occurred in their landscapes and homes and to the people and creatures that inhabit it. I will also add that following the subsequent COVID-19 pandemic um, that we've been experiencing, some of these poems are doubly relevant in expressing a sense of cabin, cabin fever and children restricted to the indoors, a common theme in 2020, whether it be in relation to the avoidance of bushfire smoke or the spread of coronavirus. The best outcome would be for these poems to engage people with the reality of climate change and its impacts and facilitate further conversations about the actions needed going forward. You can read more of my work, monostitch poems as well as longer pieces at my website on www.amandaanastasipoetry.com. I also encourage those viewers who are interested in learning more about climate science and climate change impacts to visit the Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub website. Here you will find the work of multi-genre artists and other multidisciplinary professionals translating climate science in clear, accessible ways. 
Thank you for listening and please stay tuned for the writers to follow, uh, Alexandra Hollis and Maya Hodge. And uh, uh, please follow um, and share the amazing uh, work in the Monastery Poems um, uh, by Amanda. Uh, you will also find her social media platforms um, and handles online as well. Uh, thank you again, Amanda. Uh, next up, uh, we have Alexandra. Alexandra Hollis is a writer from Aotearoa, currently living in Nam, also known as Melbourne. Her work has appeared in Best New Zealand 2015, Sport, Sick Leave, Sweet, Mammalian, and elsewhere. Kia ora, Alexandra. Kia ora, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land and I would like to pay my respects now to all the elders past, present and emerging, um, as well as elsewhere in this country, allegedly. Um, going to begin. <laughs> what does it mean to live after the known destruction of the earth, after the knowing of the destruction of the earth, but before it properly occurs? Not that it will occur all at once, not that it's not occurring already. The knowledge of this destruction came belatedly, after the fact, as the fact, in the middle of enacting. How do we live without consumption? How do we live knowing it's beyond action? We might as well, we might as well keep living as we did, not so much armed with knowledge as burdened by it. Is this a grace period? Disastrous, literally full of disasters, but not final. It could last hundreds of years. Eventually, the earth will turn into something unrecognizable. The earth is turning into something unrecognizable. What does it mean to be a human in a time of the known degradation of the earth we've known? A time of inexorable endings, not quite the end times, but also, yes, the end times. I assume either the world will continue the way it has or I won't survive. I never thought about lingering close to death, surrounded by death, living during, through, as the gradual cyclical worsening, complicit in destruction the limits of individual action, but now terror. In the park, the trees are black. It's a new year, but everything continues. The weather from yesterday rolls into the weather today. The weather from today rolls across the sea. The weather from today rolls so far across the sea, it wraps the whole planet in smoke. The weather today is that the sky is an unnatural shade of orange. The sun is the smallest it's ever been, a tiny red dot, and the light, if we can call it light, is coming from everywhere at once, filtered through tons of ash. So there are no real shadows on the ground, no dimension to anything. In the stairwell, we flap our clothes, wet from sweat, and cough. Some days, still, this is a decay which requires observational vigilance to be believed. We are alarmingly plastic. I walk to work or home, I wake and sleep. The trees do something, grow or change, roots torn from the ground, rain comes down. Winters are grayer, wetter, shorter, hotter, longer. We expend a not inconsiderable amount of effort into passing out the weather crises that are symptoms of wider climate change from the weather crises that are not. I think this effort is mostly wasted. This is not an energy efficient time. When you breathe, it's the tide flooding a small cave at the bottom of a cliff, waves exhaling against rocks. Birds are being doused in sea spray and coming up for air half as small again. I am covered in salt. Everywhere water is meeting rock. Everywhere rocks are being wrenched apart. Mountains are being torn into shreds by the constant movement of water. Everywhere rocks are being wrenched apart. Mountains are being important. And and mountains are being torn into shreds. In my own stupid life, I develop complex systems for moving my rubbish away from myself, shifting it from smaller to progressively larger bins, sanitizing myself from it, 
the bin in the bedroom and to the bin in the kitchen to the bin outside, the bin outside to the side of the street and the right 12 hour window. Too early and it just lingers in people's way. The dogs get at it. Too late and I miss the collection. Watch the truck go down the street knowing the bag's still in the garden and I have to live with it for another week longer. Rubbish from the side of the street to processing plants on the edge of the city. The city that keeps going far past what's called its edges. Places where it's okay to have rubbish buried or burnt or rotting. Dump it all. What is this land? It's only people's backyards. In the sea, plastics becoming microplastics. Microplastics becoming part of ocean currents, becoming the foundation of the food chain. Swept into fish's open mouths, absorbed by plants, growing on the shore, eaten by animals, people. Everywhere in the world, there's people that are dying, Kim. Everywhere in the world, water is rising or disappearing. Everywhere in the world, something is on fire. A building, a street, a forest, a lake, a river. Grey waves like a slow build-up of dust, layering sediment across sediment. Oil slicking onto more oil. Oil dredged up, salty and suffering from the bends, from the ground beneath the deepest ocean. Oil mined from the cracks between mountains. Oil pouring out onto the arid dirt, belonging to prominent queer entertainers, but who's surprised by that? Oil lapping at, licking at boots. Boots on the ground, baby, gotta lick the oil off those boots. How do we begin knowing it's all over? How do we begin to construct our lives on ground that's one good rain away from falling in on itself? What can we do in the world? What can we do to the world? How can we live knowing our lifelong allotment of grief has been kindly supplemented, increased far beyond what any person ought to be able to bear? How can we live with the utter malignancy of our lives? What comes after this? What can grow here? What kind of justice can we find when the losses are incalculable, incalculable, ongoing and deliberate? If this is a grace period, what's the absence of grace? After the ice has left, the side of the mountain doesn't know what to do with itself. Unfamiliar geography, fresh terrain, open to air for the first time in all its memories. The observation decks retreat even further back. Invisible to us, plants grow in alien soil. Rocks broken into gullies, where land moved like water, coursing rapidly down to sea, rising and swelling into summer, letting loose icebergs and flocks of migrating birds, the fish at the top of the water, picked off and pummeled in waves. As if the sand won't be made stark and sodden where water washes above it. As if what remains on the shore is a place to live and breathe on still earth, a place to lie out in the sun. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, I feel your, your passion and um, your, your concerns and uh, very much in my own thinking. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, next we have uh, Maya. Uh, Maya Hodge is a proud Gladiol woman raised in Nigeria. Gladiol woman raised in Nigeria. Based on the country, Maya is an emerging poet, artist, curator, and musician who works for healing through the art. Maya is the true winner of the Ten Nature Indigenous Writing Award. The poetry is published in Overland Literary Magazine, uh, Poetry, uh, poetry Review, and Not Life Magazine. So, welcome, Maya. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I work and reside on. I'd also like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging, acknowledge their continued connection to country and art making and um, everything that we do to heal. 
Um, so I am going to read for you a poem that I wrote. Um, so it's very close to my heart and probably to uh, a lot of um, First Nations people's art. In a short amount of time, we are seeing the quickened destruction of our land, our waterways. This is no phase. Our rivers bend through sand. Our rainforests reach up high. Our mountains lay resting, yet a sickness is festering. In the coal mines, in government lies, in burning bushfires, and they continue to pry into sacred places that are not for their eyes or their drills and greed, allowing toxins to breed. Into the deep rolling sea, the plants and trees. Saltwater erosion and rising that will erase rock art and at our heart, Uluru sings quietly in the night. Hot wind and high temperatures will one day honeycomb, honeycomb its surface. Our song lines will ripple futures. Wild, unrelenting bushfires scorch the tender earth. Our skies filled with smoke that hung in the air for months infected our lungs and clouded our eyes, sacred country burning, blood red skies. Hear us, hear us, the cries of this land, the cries of our people. We are one with this place. The trees are our limbs, the dirt is our feet, see us weep. Like the gale force winds, our people heave and shout like the birds, the birds above flying elsewhere. The flowers are blooming at different times of year and the foods have shifted. Try not to let the young ones fear. So we adapt and change for 250 years to protect our blood ties and listen to this country's painful cries. Each generation brings new hope. Their hearts beat in time to the swishing of the eucalyptus, the hum of the warm rocks. With caring hands, we continue to care for country and so will our children, this country's children. Kawabaya in my language, strong fighter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maya. And what a beautiful way to, um, to just bring, every, bring everything together um, for tonight's gathering. So thank you again. And uh, I just want to thank Maya Hodges, Amanda Anastasi, Alexandra Hollis, and Folale. A special thank you to Emerging Writers Festi Festival support team from Zoe, Rob, Millie, Bayliss, and the team behind the scenes for making this possible. Thank you to the extended Emerging Writers Festival team. And also a special thank you again to our partners, Yarra Libraries. And please don't forget to visit them online for more information. That said, also, please follow um, our amazing lineup. Um, you also find the social handles and platforms uh, online on the website. Uh, lastly, uh, making good art costs money. Over half the Emerging Writers Festival program is free and they're committed to keeping ticket prices for paid events low so that practicing writers can access the festival. This has been especially important this year in response to COVID-19 pandemic and the loss of work for artists and storytellers around the globe. If you've enjoyed tonight's performance, 
please consider chucking Emerging Writers Festivals some, some change. If 20 people each gave $5, that would pay one of tonight's performers. It's easy to become an Emerging Writers Festival pen pal by donating through their website. And lastly, I just wanna thank you all for joining and uh, please don't forget to check out other amazing events and artists who are featured um, at this year's festival. Uh, that is all, um, Papatai Lava and uh, please be well, take care.